A very warm welcome to this webinar entitled, Is Your City Seizing the Benefits of District Energy? This is brought to you under the Global District Energy in Cities Initiative, coordinated by UNEP, and the implementing mechanism uh, for the District Energy Accelerator Platform of Sustainable Energy for All. Um, my name is Anna March. I work with ECLEI. Uh, ECLEI is an international association uh, of local governments, and ECLEI is hosting this webinar in cooperation with UNEP. Uh, as a partner of the initiative, uh, as a key focal point for local governments, and also as co coordinator for capacity building in the initiative. Um, I see that uh, people are still joining the session, so I'm going to continue with a brief introduction just to let you know. Uh, we expect to have in the session with us today, in addition to the speakers that I will um, introduce shortly, uh, we will have with us uh, cities joining us from different regions in the world, uh, including Brazil, uh, Chile, Colombia, uh, India, Sweden, and the United States, and also uh, several entities from different sectors, including academia and consultancy. So we hope this will be an interesting session for you. Let me now show you the agenda we have programmed for today. So we will begin the session with an introduction to the Global District Energy in Cities Initiative by UNEP. Uh, it will then be followed by a presentation regarding the key concepts, namely what is understood by modern district energy, what are its key benefits, the key determinants of feasibility, key policies and processes for promoting district energy, then uh, I will hand over to a colleague from ICLE South Asia who will uh, present on the opportunities for district cooling in Indian cities as the results of rapid assessments that have been carried out. Then we will invite cities in the call to share their experiences and priorities regarding district energy and I'm very glad to announce that we have the opportunity to have a presentation from Gothenburg Energy by Patrick Arzel and uh, we very much want to uh, encourage all the cities in the call to indeed share with us on your interests. Uh, then we'll have the opportunity as well for questions and answers and uh, we'll wrap up the session uh, with a brief overview of upcoming activities. Uh, during the webinar, uh, we will have the technical support from my colleague, Louisa Weiss, and she will now tell us how you can make the best use of this session. Louisa? Thank you very much, Anna. My, as, as Anna said, my name is Louisa Weiss. I uh, support uh, this webinar from the technical side. Uh, I work for the Equal Capacity Center. And uh, I would like to tell you, first of all, that for the entire uh, duration of the presentations that will be given, you are muted. We will leave you muted um, until the end in the question and answer session, where we are happy to engage in a discussion with you. But uh, throughout the webinar, we encourage you to give us your comments, your questions, your remarks. And please do so by typing these inputs into the question box that you see in front of you. We will see your questions and we will either answer them directly or get back to you in the question and answer session. If you have any technical difficulties, please also type them in this question box and we will be happy to assist you as far as we can. I hope you will enjoy this webinar with us. And Thank, you, Thank you, Louise. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, very good. So I see that people still continue to join the session. So once again, a very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, now it is my pleasure to hand over to uh, our first 
speaker, uh, Lily Riachi, advisor on sustainable energy in cities uh, with the United Nations Environmental Program. Uh, Lily, over to you. Thank you, Anna. Um, so good afternoon and I guess good morning to some depending on your time zone uh, and good evening to others. I'm happy to, to join this initiative. My name is Lily Riahi. I'm working on, on as an advisor on sustainable energy in cities at UN Environment and uh, managing the Global District Energy in Cities initiative. Um, next. Can we, yeah, okay. So, um, I just I usually ask this question when I'm in, in conferences and, and workshops and I ask how many people actually think that this uh, this picture represents what the UN does or UN environment does. Um, I think people often ask themselves what difference can you know we at this at working at such a high level make um, to the work that you're undertaking on a day to day basis and I guess many people think sometimes that it's not applicable. But I can tell you that my experience tells me otherwise. It's been only three years since I've started the District Energy and Cities Initiative, and I've seen its impact, and it's um, quite exponential. I guess the first thing to say is that the UN does not only spend its time on such high-level negotiations, but a lot of UN agencies, like such as UN Environment, spend a lot of time helping governments strengthen their policy and regulatory frameworks at the local and national level and also to build capacity to implement the solutions to these negotiations and, and what they stand for. <clears throat> at UN Environment, that is very much the core part of our work. Um, and so this, what that means is that we have a history of working with different countries, there's trust, and we have a jurisdiction to support policy development. And this gives the initiative the opportunity to work with governments and set in place policies like mandatory local heat planning, or to support underwriting loans for district energy, or set price regulation. So these are these are um, some of the areas in which we work with the policy level. But of course, um, we we don't only do that. All the high-level political negotiations that we do contribute to help shape the options that governments consider as favorable. Not because we can force any government to take action, but because we have the ability to create momentum within governments on the policy priorities. And that's because we are seen as a neutral body and because at the end of the day, governments are like people and people like to belong to clubs. And so you often see that uh, once one government starts to take a lead, then another joins and another joins and you have a huge momentum being built on important solutions to our climate and energy ambitions. So three things, policies, capacity building training and awareness raising. That's really the core activities we're doing and that's exactly what we're doing in the Global District Energy in Cities Initiative. Next, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, in the initiative, uh, we are we work with as a neutral platform with experts from all over the world who've been working in this field for you know decades uh, on district energy and. We leverage their expertise, their knowledge, um, and their experiences to support cities and countries around the world, um, from governments from local to national level, and the stakeholders to do the uh, activities I've just mentioned. So raising awareness, um, doing demonstration projects, and through demonstration projects, building capacity. So taking cities through the process of actually developing these uh, sort of multi-stakeholder, uh, quite complicated infrastructure projects and uh, achieving their political objectives and through that helping them build capacity. We help put in place the policy frameworks at the local level but also at the national level so that uh, cities can and do what they can do best um, by having also supportive national frameworks. And then we seek to scale uh, in the countries we work in and also replicate regionally um, and globally the uh, the activities that we've carried out in the demonstration uh, countries and cities. So we're working with six countries, and um, that's um, Chile, China, India, Serbia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Morocco. Um, and we work with 40 cities uh, across those countries, but also neighboring countries, and uh, multiple partners. So yes, you can take the next slide. 
So just to give a quick example of what we've been doing, when we first started this work uh, three years ago, um, district energy was really nowhere to be found on the UN agenda or on the global policy agenda. Um, it was hard to see that even though uh, many countries, champion countries like Denmark, Germany and, and others, the EU and, and the US and Canada have been promoting district energy for all of its multiple benefits, but it was not really anywhere to be seen. It was absent from all the documents. Um, next slide. So what did we do? We um, basically did the same thing you do when you convince any stakeholder to take action on district energy. We um, showed it how it meets their political objectives, and, it's, um, and that's what I guess Anna will be speaking about. We showed evidence on, on and stories and data on the multiple benefits of district energy, and we um, ensured that there was uh, a momentum being built from the different stakeholders. And we told the stories, the stories of the cities on this calls and the story and cities around the world that are have been doing this um, have been championing district energy and what we see now today um, is that we've successfully put district energy on the global agenda um, we have uh, the G20 uh, efficiency uh, leadership group uh, adopted a focus on district energy and it's a, it's a working group being uh, led with by Saudi Arabia together with China and Russia and Singapore so that's a very big um, uh, I guess a sign for the priority that district energy takes now on the policy agenda. Um, just last month in Quito, we saw that the um, the urban agenda also looks at district energy as a as a solution to integrating renewables and efficiency in cities. Um, we've launched this global program with support from the Global Environment Facility, and on and on. So um, <clears throat> what that means for your work um, is that. The governments at the national level are paying attention to this, and so it's easier to then put in place the no local policies when you can point out and say, hey, what we're doing in our city is important, and we need to support supporting frameworks, and look, all the other countries are taking action, so we need you to also take action. So it, it creates that kind of momentum um, that's important also for local action. Um, another example, more on the next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, another example here is, of course, the policy and capacity building and demonstration project side of the initiative. Um, and this is an example of one of the cities we're working with, Banja Luka, in the um, country of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, they had significant problems in Banja Luka with, um, with pollution. Um, because they use heavy fuel oil, they had a lot of efficiency losses, a lot of water losses. Um, and this made district energy uh, become more expensive than coal and, and, and biomass burning and indoors, um, which was leading to significant financial pressure on the district heating utility. And um, a lot of companies, a lot of banks had come in and done assessments, you know, feasibility studies for the city, but the city felt like um, these assessments were not really looking at anything beyond projects. They were just looking at um, a very narrow um, view and were not providing the city with an understanding of what actions they can take to invest in their district heating network, modernize it, bring renewables online, and thereby meet their longer term objectives, their sustainability objectives, their city goals, how to mobilize the stakeholders in the city to accept this kind of investment. And this is the work that we've started to do with the city. We, we came in, we started to do this kind of assessment work, looking at what they could um, invest in in their city, how they could then uh, bring on renewables, and how that would al allow them to achieve um, some of their city objectives like uh, air pollution uh, mitigation. And by doing that, and by bringing together the different stakeholders also from the national government, um, the local mayor, the district heating utility company, we were able to get that kind of buy-in and support that is needed in a district energy project um, for it to be successful. And this priority investment plan that we developed was then approved by the city, uh, city government and um, they've and has now been used as the basis for development in the city and as a result has also attracted investment, uh, potential investment from the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Um, to help the city actually uh, build out uh, this, uh, rehabilitate and bring on renewables into their network, and um, 
and by doing this, uh, the city will actually be able to achieve a reduction of uh, 18,000 tons of carbon dioxide each year and save 1.5 million euros in fuel um, for the city. So uh, that's an example concretely of some of the project level uh, activities we are doing um, to help mobilize investment in, in district energy in cities. Uh, next slide. So um, this is just the last slide I'll end with, and that's just to summarize uh, what I've uh, taken you through in terms of the initiative's activities. As mentioned, uh, we have the, the work on the global outreach, and that's where I would invite cities on the call or other partners on the call to join us in building this momentum, in getting the right messaging out there, and making sure that, the, that our national governments are paying attention to this as a, as a climate energy solution. Um, then we're doing the work in the countries. Uh, as I mentioned, the six countries are, are indicated here. And in those countries, as I said, we're doing the policy work, the capacity building, and the demonstration projects. And that is the work that we do with cities. And I'm happy to give more detail if uh, requested. And then, um, and there again, there's an opportunity to work together, either to receive that information, receive that support, or to help others uh, with the best practices that you've been uh, developing in your cities and countries. And then we we then uh, look to partner with other countries to scale up the lessons that we've learned and the examples that we've seen uh, developed in these countries that we're working with. And with that, I'd like to uh, say thank you and um, thank you for joining us and hand it over to, back to Anna, um, who will be able to speak a bit more about why we've chosen to focus on district energy um, and, and the benefits that it will bring, can bring to your city. Thank you very much, Lily, for this uh, global perspective and this call to action. It certainly is great to be part of this initiative. Uh, thank you so much for the work you have been doing. Um, I would like to actually invite the participants now to take a poll. Uh, Louisa, if I could get your help to launch the first poll, perhaps, just to get a feel for uh, the the experiences from the participants we already have in the call. Uh, in the meantime, I will also prepare for the next uh, for the next presentation. Uh, let me see. Okay, I see that the participants are voting as we speak. Most of the people have already voted. And I don't see it changing. Perhaps we can already close the poll. And this, ah, okay, everyone has voted now. Great. Louisa, is it possible to see the results? Okay, very good. Um, so with this, Ah, okay, I see that the participants can already see it as well. So most of the participants in this call actually indicate that their cities do not have district energy systems. So thank you. I, I think this is good to know uh, as we move to the next presentation. So Louisa, if you could help me uh, get back uh, to be able to share my screen once again. Okay, thank you very much. So, during the next presentation, we'll be speaking a little bit about some information that may be useful for cities that indeed are starting in this process and that really want to mobilize their local government and their stakeholders uh, regarding the benefits of district energy uh, and also want to assess uh, the viability of implementing district energy in the in their jurisdiction in their in their territory we'll also be looking at some of the key processes to implement district energy but of course this is only a first webinar of a series of webinars so as we go through the different sessions we'll have opportunity to focus on different policy aspects and project development aspects so I hope uh, this will be of interest to you. I, I ask for your, a bit of your patience for those people that are already very experienced on district energy because we will cover some basic concepts 
but I hope you will still find useful information in this presentation. So why are we talking about district heating and uh, uh, district cooling? Uh, why is it important? Indeed, heating, hot water and cooling account for 60% of global energy consumption in buildings, which is largely met by fossil fuels currently. And uh, as we discuss how to implement the P and reach the targets of the Paris Agreement, uh, we actually should be concerned regarding the trends because indeed the trend is for the demand to continue to grow and particularly regarding cooling. Uh, and we can see here actually some values on the screen regarding the projection for Asia and Latin America. So this is indeed a very relevant topic. But what is it exactly that we are talking about? So here are the basic concepts um, regarding district heating. So we can say that district heating is a system that delivers space heating and hot water to multiple customers and these can be buildings uh, from different types of uses, residential, commercial, institutional, industrial even. Uh, and this is delivered through a pipe network uh, where hot water or steam circulates. Um, and the heat can be produced in one or multiple plants and using different fuels. This is just a very basic configuration. In the interface with each a consumer building, what do we have? Actually, the district energy network typically does not go into each home unit or office unit within the customer's facilities. Instead, typically there is an energy transfer station where a heat exchanger uh, converts the, uh, transfers the thermal energy from the district energy network to the building's energy system. Similarly, with district cooling, uh, we have uh, a, a plant, a pipe network, and we have the multiple consumers. This time, the district energy system delivers space cooling and process cooling for multiple consumers. And through the pipe network, we typically have chilled water circulating. So what is it uh, that is interesting? Uh, regarding district energy by comparison with individual systems. So this graph here tries to uh, represent uh, a typical uh, consumption th of heating throughout the day, for example in a home and in an office. And so in a home, for example, as we see consumption is low during the night, it peaks as people wake up, then it decreases as people go to work and then increases again in the evening for dinner time and so on. And this profile is different from an office. Uh, so one thing that we can note from such a graphic is that individual building systems operate far below their capacity and uh, away also from their optimum energy efficiency for most of the time during the day. And this means that because they are away from their point of uh, highest energy efficiency, they are consuming more and this also has impact on the maintenance needs. Of course, in any case, the systems need to be dimensioned to meet the peak capacity. And so when, a, uh, when the equi equipment is, is bought, of course, we also need to pay for that capacity which is unused for most of the time. So district energy, by aggregating the demand from different consumer groups, uh, it actually enables to have an overall uh, more flat profile, a more um, a flattened demand uh, curve. So with this, the system uh, production can operate closer to the, the maximum capacity and maximum efficiency points. And in addition, these systems enable uh, the use of more efficient technologies that might not be viable at a single building scale. So economies of scale are definitely already one benefit of district energy. But so when we talk about modern district energy, what exactly are we talking about? So in addition to the multiple consumer types that uh, we've already mentioned, 
Uh, modern district energy is a way to a decentralized way to provide energy and which typically integrates uh, multiple uh, sources of energy including renewable heating and cooling for example through heat recovery from sewage or fuel free cooling usage of free cooling from lakes for example uh, these systems typically have thermal storage uh, very often use lower operating temperatures very often integrate combined heat and power generation and they are moving to switch away from fossil fuels they may also integrate and balance high shares of variable renewable energy such as wind um, and of course uh, monitor monitoring and control systems are in place to help optimize operations and the viable business model is in place to cover operation maintenance and replacement costs uh, that ensure the continued uh, delivery of service quality and reliability so this is what we are talking about it's about modern district energy and now just the slides just to zoom in on combined heat and power generation or co-generation um, power generation by itself is a very inefficient process where a lot of energy is lost as heat and cogeneration enables to increase efficiency very significantly to more than 80% uh, therefore really incre increasing significantly, significantly uh, the efficiency of primary energy use but let's look at examples from cities uh, throughout the world. Uh, what do they show us regarding the benefits of district energy? And these uh, are compiled from multiple sources, including from the guide developed uh, by uh, UNEP, uh, which Lily has mentioned already. Uh, this case in particular, I believe, is from the Carbon Climate Registry. Uh, Copenhagen in Denmark reported significant savings in primary energy consumption by capturing waste heat from electricity production and also from waste incineration and this is very significant and on average it has a significant impact on the reduction of household builds as well as on reducing the amount of oil consumed and uh, CO2 emissions to the atmosphere Another example comes from China, Anshan, where a project for the recovery of heat from a local steel plant uh, is expected to save about 1.2 million, million tons per year uh, and with a payback period of three years. Uh, North Vancouver, Canada reports um, estimated savings of uh, gas consumption of about 15 percent uh, thanks to the district energy system by comparison with standalone boilers in single buildings so quite a few examples from different parts of the world for example another project uh, from Port Louis in Mauritius uh, this time for district cooling where the use of sea uh, seawater for district cooling uh, in the city center is expected to significantly reduce the strain on the electricity grid by, uh, and the forecast is that it will reduce the peak electricity demand of the country uh, by 6% um, and this will of course enable through the use of renewable energy in this case free cooling uh, again the reduction in the carbon footprint but different types of benefits are reported, including socioeconomic, of course, uh, not just to the energy system. A very good example is regarding employment, and in this case, Oslo in Norway uh, reports uh, 1,375 full-time jobs related to the to their district energy system. Paris, France, um, has very well developed district heating and district cooling systems um, and uh, this brings an annual income for the city uh, of around 2 million euros and this in addition also 
helps the city pursue uh, social obje objectives such as providing affordable heat to social housing. Social housing is indeed um, very significant in Paris. One in five Parisians live in social, social housing. Another uh, example now from North America, a couple of examples from North America. For example, St. Paul in Minnesota reports that uh, through district energy they are able to keep uh, 12 million US dollars circulating in the local economy as opposed to importing fossil fuels. Um, in Canada, Prince Edward Island estimates that for every dollar spent on biomass fuel for district energy, 70% uh, or 70 cents stays within the local economy um, versus only 10 cents or 10% in the case of a dollar spent on oil. So a lot of, a lot of benefits at different levels. Again, uh, regarding emissions uh, through the avoidance of fossil fuel consumptions, uh, we can reduce the emissions of greenhouse gas but also of air pollutants such as particulate matter, um, nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide, and these are the estimates that Milan reported for the year 2011. Uh, another is example, and uh, I wanted to bring this example on district cooling from the north, from a northern city, or in this case from uh, Stockholm. Uh, where district cooling uh, uses heat pumps to extract energy from seawater and wastewater and uh, through this about 50,000 tons of CO2 emissions are avoided annually. Uh, one, one last example I, don't resi I cannot resist uh, from the city of Vacu in Sweden as well. Um, and this this city uh, has indeed uh, made a lot of progress in the ne in the last couple of decades, and uh, they are really transitioning to a system uh, of uh, fully renewable, 100% renewable energy. They aim to reach that objective at community scale uh, in the different forms of energy. And regarding district heating, they are almost achieving the target. In 2015, over 96% of the heat uh, was produced uh, from biomass and also a small fraction from geothermal. And of course, district heating uh, is instrumental in this in uh, in this coverage of heating through through renewable sources. So this is a very good example of how district energy enables to convert a very large amount of consumers to low carbon uh, or 100% renewable energy sources in a fairly short period of time and without individual renovations in buildings. So just to recap very briefly, uh, this different uh, types of benefits that we've seen in addition to the socioeconomic benefits such as employments, we see that district energy delivers economies of scale, more efficient technologies can be used, renewable energy at a larger scale can be used, and through the use of multiple, multiple fuels we can take advantage of market conditions and local resources to provide more reliable uh, supply of energy, heating and cooling, and uh, this indeed can contribute to the rapid transformation of the energy system and uh, reduce air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions. We saw benefits for the community as a whole. How about for specific groups and some very important groups actually, such as for example developers or building owners. What can you say about the benefits that district energy offers them? Energy services provided by qualified professionals, enabling developers to focus on their core business. Uh, it also offers reduction of capital costs on buildings energy systems. It increases the floor space for rental and sale due to reduced size of the building's energy systems, including uh, boilers, including fuel, uh, fuel uh, reservoirs and storage, hot water storage, and etc. Um, energy price uh, certainty for heating and cooling can also be 
part of an arrangement, so this can also be an advantage in comparison to other options. And improved safety and avoidance of uh, noise or foul loaders in the buildings. How about to the consumers? District Energy certainly offers some uh, very specific benefits. The services are provided by qualified professionals, uh, translating into increased service reliability and quality, and again, avoidance of capital costs on equipment that is underutilized for most of the time, as we've discussed previously. The district energy also delivers energy savings and cost savings as the user pays only for the heat that is actually used and again improved safety and avoidance of noise or odors. Um, this slide reports on results uh, that were compiled by a, a European project uh, factor and uh, this project indicates that uh, these are the key deciding factors for most consumers in the residential sector, comfort level, total economic savings and initial investment. In the services sector it's very similar but here the comfort level is replaced by reliability and safety. So one aspect that you should keep in mind when, uh, uh, when uh, informing and exchanging uh, seeking to mobilize your uh, your stakeholders is of course regarding total economic savings keep in mind total cost of connection versus the cost of installing replacing of individual boilers and of course the running costs of both alternatives these are very relevant factors so we've seen a lot of lots of the benefits that uh, modern district energy can deliver uh, to the, the community and to the consumers and so I hope that uh, if you had questions in your mind you are now more motivated <laughs> still to pursue uh, district energy in your community and so what should you keep uh, in mind when assessing the viability of district energy? These are some of the key questions uh, and still at a high level. So is there high heat or cooling demand? Can we identify uh, high heating or cooling demand density areas or building clusters? If indeed uh, you can answer yes to these questions then um, you still need to go into further detail but these are good places to start. Uh, indeed the, this, the heat density uh, is one of the key factors to consider. This image that I'm showing you is from a simulation done with a tool called Plan 4D. This was developed, this tool was developed with support from the International Energy Agency and within the next webinar session we will look more detail into this. But so this horizontal blue line here that you can see is the costs for individual building solutions and uh, uh, this graphic represents the, the savings that can be achieved or additional costs uh, but basically compares district heating with individual solutions and we see that as heat density increases the more interesting district energy becomes. Of course these values uh, depend on the location um, but it's just to illustrate what we're talking about. Regarding other relevant determinants in the assessment of the viability of district energy, of course the availability of low-cost energy sources nearby is, is a very important factor such as renewable energy as we've mentioned already uh, but also for example waste heat. Uh, the costs of the alternative uh, technologies is also very very relevant, uh, but also the regulatory framework, incentive schemes, uh, the existing energy infrastructure and uh, 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 conditions regarding access to it, the local availability of suppliers, technologies and skills and so on, particularly regarding the technologies that you are considering, of course, these are all uh, relevant uh, aspects to consider. 
but so uh, where to start in the process? Uh, of course, uh, each each case is a case, uh, but uh, as we try to mobilize more and more cities to engage in this process of uh, of promoting modern district energy in their territories and taking advantage of the multiple benefits it delivers, uh, the starting point matters. Uh, and so, if you are uh, focusing on uh, a new development area. Here you have the opportunity to optimize the district energy investments by redesigning the, the new development areas to have higher load density and uh, to promote mixed-use zoning so that the demand curve will flatten out as we've discussed earlier. It's also an opportunity to consolidate existing areas within field development and intensification policies. But if you are interested in exploring district energy on, uh, for example, the city center on an already consolidated and well-developed area, then your focus needs to go to, to those that are potentially the biggest consumers that you have. and consumers uh, where the local government can have a high influence. So ideally, public buildings uh, with water-based central heating or central cooling systems that uh, where those systems are already in need of a replacement, these will be the ideal targets uh, to consider in the development of demonstration projects for your area. So indeed, we see that the, the process varies a little bit. Of course, even in new development um, and in the redevelopment of already existing areas, um, although this gives you higher opportunities to enhance the viability of district energy, it also has an added risk, which is a high load uncertainty because the system actually needs to be built before the the load or the consumers move in typically. So it is crucial to coordinate the phasing of the district energy system with the urban development phasing. It's also essential to create a favorable regulatory framework that will support um, that and contribute to load certainty and uh, of course stakeholder engagement, particularly developers, is, is also crucial. Some useful tools include future uh, energy scenario modeling tools um, and models for cost comparison of heating and cooling alternatives for urban development. And as mentioned, uh, we will be looking at uh, a few examples of this in the upcoming webinar. Uh, if you are looking at uh, already developed and consolidated areas, uh, I've already mentioned this crucial aspects uh, to mention. So the more attractive buildings will be those that uh, use uh, water-based systems within the building. Uh, and the opportunity for the strict energy is conditioned by the cycles of renovation of the building's energy systems. So here uh, it is good to consider really targeted marketing of the district energy. Some useful tools can also be identified and in future webinars, not in the next one, but uh, later on we will also look into this uh, regarding, for example, uh, how to prioritize and, uh, and how to use heat density maps to work on the strategy. So this is Simplify. We have made this separate outline for new development and uh, already developed areas, but indeed, of course, um, one goes hand in hand with the other. And within a city, we may have different areas uh, where different approaches come, in, come into play. And uh, of course, once we, while on the left-hand side for new development, we are talking about strategy, energy master planning, uh, the review of the policy and the integration of policy regulation and administrative procedures alignment, then this, this is the enabler to then the process on the right-hand side where we have the project development and implementation. So there are a lot of uh, touching points in this and uh, indeed 
where where possible these should be implemented in tandem because they will generate synergies it makes sense if a project is well aligned with the city's existing strategy uh, for energy and existing targets and contributes to achieve them this this top line that is here this is uh, part of the guidance you will find man, many more um, um, a lot more detailed information uh, in the Solutions Gateway. The Solutions Gateway is an online platform for local governments where solutions indeed are processes that the local governments can implement and uh, during December uh, several solutions will be made available specifically focusing on district heating and district cooling. So stay uh, uh, this is sort of a heads up uh, and uh, in a way also an invitation for you to engage. We'll come back to this um, further further into the webinar, into this session. Let's see, I believe I've already spoke a lot, I've already spoken too much <laughs> I think uh, and this is time, uh, this is I think good time before handing over to the next speaker. Uh, I think this is a good time to launch a poll. Louisa, could I have your support here to launch the next poll? We would like, with this, we would like to uh, to hear from you uh, on your on the plans from your local area regarding the implementation uh, of district energy. So the question is whether is regarding past projects in this particular poll and the next poll will inquire regarding future plans. So with this we 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 are encouraging you to share with us if your city has implemented district energy projects recently and the options are yes, this is ongoing, yes, in the last one to five years, no or don't know. And most of the people have already voted. I think we can close this poll thank you we can already we can already see oh and it's uh, indeed good to see that uh, that work has been done recently and um, according to most of the participants in the poll very good let's uh, let's uh, use the next poll and this pertains to the plans for using district energy in the in the near future Mm -hmm. I would encourage, okay, I see it's still advancing. I would encourage you all to, to vote in this, in this poll. Okay, thank you very much. I would also like to take uh, this opportunity to remind you that uh, uh, at any time feel free to type questions into the questions uh, panel. We'll keep an eye out uh, for this. You can also raise your hand if you have any pressing questions to either of the presentations that are, have already been delivered. In the meantime, I am going to invite my colleague Ashish Verma 
Energy uh, and Climate Manager at ICLE South Asia to deliver the next presentation on the assessment of district cooling opportunities in several cities in India. Ashish, I'm going to ask you to please unmute yourself. Oh, I see the results of the poll that had not been closed before. Okay, thank you very much. So regarding the last poll, if the regarding the city plans to implement, expand or retrofit district energy systems in the future, the majority of the respondents indicates that this is being considered, although the details are not yet defined. And this is already part in 17% of the cases, this is already part of the municipal work plan for 2017. This is very good, very, very promising. Thank you. Thank you all for participating. Uh, Ashish, please let me know how you'd like to proceed now. Uh, shall we hand over the screen to you? Okay, very good. I can already see your screen. I cannot hear you yet. Ashish, this is Louisa speaking. If you go to uh, the section audio in the GoToWebinar interface, you can double check whether you've selected the computer audio or whether the phone is still selected. This may be the issue. While we wait and uh, Ashish checks his sound, I would uh, again like to encourage any questions from the audience um, and like I said uh, we very much look forward no. to hearing oh yes we very much look forward to hearing from the cities in the call in this session uh, to hear from your interests and expectations regarding district energy Ashish uh, thank you very much uh, the floor is yours thank you so much Um, so you can uh, see that screen now. Yes, we can see it. Okay, thank you so much. <clears throat> yeah, uh, and thank you so much for uh, giving us this opportunity to present about the findings of the rapid assessment. So I would rather say it, uh, the process that has been followed and uh, the the outcomes that we have been receiving uh, throughout this process of rapid assessments in Indian cities. Uh, so we have been engaged by UNEP to carry out these uh, rapid assessments in five Indian cities, uh, namely Thane, uh, Pune, uh, Coimbatore, um, Bhopal, and uh, Rajkot. So uh, we have uh, already uh, collected a lot of information for these five cities and uh, uh, came up with the initial findings uh, which uh, we have sort of presented uh, in the in the workshop uh, that we have conducted in May this year and then following which uh, we have again uh, uh, you know started more deep level of uh, information collection from all these five cities to basically know um, if, if the, what is the potential uh, in in an in few of those cities to uh, to engage them them uh, for the deeper level of assessment. So I have uh, some few slides which I would want to share with the audience. <clears throat> Please go on presentation mode, Ashish. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, this is uh, this particular slide basically talks about what kind of uh, 
potential is there in in cities in india so as you can see uh, uh, like the population growth is of course rising uh, tremendously <clears throat> and there is a projection there is a estimated uh, projection uh, for the year 2030 which says like 30 percent per decade uh, population growth and which will eventually reach 590 million by 2030 and uh, the uh, as uh, as well as uh, along with the population uh, the floor area ratio the floor uh, space index is also growing uh, especially driven by the uh, growth rate in residential uh, sector uh, commercial uh, retail and hospital sector uh, I would also like to mention here uh, food demand which is you know highly uh, uh, shared by the uh, by the cooling load in Indian cities um, has also been rapidly growing and uh, we have recorded uh, the the annual growth in the sales of air conditioners and there are there are data which uh, there are projections as supported by the historical data which says uh, uh, at least 30 percent annual growth in next five years uh, for the conventional air conditioners so which you know really uh, presents with a very um, uh, very high uh, use potential high use of uh, air conditioners in indian market um, and this uh, particular information has uh, further been supported by information on uh, cooling degree days uh, as you can see in this table there are uh, uh, Ashish, sorry for interrupting. Um, we are still seeing the first slide in your presentation only. Could you oh. please check? Perhaps it is paused. May we have paused the presentation? Um, just a second. Can you see it now? Yes, yes. Is it okay? Ah, uh, yes, wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so, yeah. Um, uh, sorry about the inconvenience. Uh, so I was basically talking about this particular slide, which basically uh, presents uh, with the opportunity in uh, in Indian market for the district cooling system. Um, as you can see in this table, uh, the uh, information on population growth as well as cooling degree days. Uh, so uh, you can see, like, uh, for uh, in compare compared to countries like China, Indonesia, Brazil, and Philippines, so India has uh, a more number of cooling degree days, and the total cooling demand potential, which is um, presented in terms of billion person CDs. So that kind of uh, potential is there in uh, Indian uh, market, and um, so uh, presently the air conditioner uh, penetration in Indian market is uh, very less. Uh, at present, it is only three percent. I mean, only three percent of the population has access to air conditioning, but then it has rapidly been growing, and uh, we we are seeing at least uh, twenty to thirty percent annual increase in the uh, sales of air conditioners in India and so uh, I mean uh, all these um, uh, growth uh, has uh, has been you know uh, there are uh, there are several uh, programs by government of India um, like uh, smart cities mission and there is uh, one program on rejuvenation and transformation of uh, of, uh, of uh, the infrastructure sector in India there is housing for all uh, so and then there is the smart cities which is which was launched in the year 2015 and which uh, basically works on the 
uh, objectives of providing basic infrastructure, improved quality of life, providing clean and sustainable environment, um, apply smart solutions, set examples to be replicated. And uh, and then um, uh, particularly uh, the whole uh, program is uh, uh, has basically two major components: the Pen City initiative uh, and the area-based development. Uh, the Pen City initiative uh, is, is it requires uh, each smart city to come up with a smart solution, which needs to be applied on a city-wide scale. And the area-based development uh, is basically works on three levels: the retrofitting, redevelopment, and greenfield development. Um, so, uh, when it comes to the area-based development, I would say uh, it lies a huge, huge potential for uh, district cooling, uh, district, uh, district cooling uh, uh, technology, because uh, all these uh, area based uh, the, the areas that have been identified to be developed as area based uh, uh, development they, they they are supposed to be developed uh, as mixed used uh, uh, mixed used buildings and uh, you know um, potential having diverse uh, loads so uh, these uh, area based uh, developments are uh, ideal for uh, uh, systems like district cooling and we are working with a few of these uh, cities to uh, collect information on these area based on their land use pattern what is the kind of uh, cooling requirement will be there after these uh, areas will be developed and then, of course, uh, uh, these area-based developments uh, promote the use of smart solutions, which are sustainable and efficient, efficient in terms of energy usage. So this presents with a very high, uh, very good uh, potential uh, to be integrated with uh, systems like district cooling. Um, this uh, particular slide uh, again uh, uh, talks about uh, the cooling degree days. So these are uh, some of the findings uh, from our rapid assessments in five cities. And you can see uh, the green bars uh, for the cities in India that have been given for rapid assessments. Um, Thane, Rajkot, Coimbatore, Bhopal, and Pune. So uh, Pune uh, city, as you can see, uh, has you know the more more number of uh, cooling days than most of these cities listed in this uh, in this graph, and then uh, followed by Bhopal, Coimbatore, Rajkot, and of course Thane, uh, which is uh, an ideal uh, city for uh, for district cooling system. So uh, now uh, we are in the process of collecting, you know, more information uh, from uh, Thane, Rajkot, and uh, Bhopal cities. Uh, we want to uh, identify uh, sites, uh, potential sites in these cities for deeper level of engagement with them. And we have kind of started. Uh, collecting information, already collected a lot of information from three of these cities and that information is being analyzed and uh, we, are, uh, we are awaiting the results following which uh, we will uh, carry out the deeper level of assessments for uh, one or two cities amongst, amongst these three cities. So this is again uh, some of the findings of the rapid assessments. Uh, as you can see, I mean, for different cities, each city has got its own uh, specialty. Uh, they, there are there are few uh, numbers, uh, uh, the local information. Uh, so if you, as you can see, the Bhopal, uh, eight point seven square kilometers of new commercial area to be developed by twenty thirty one. Um, and 2.6 square kilometer of new industrial development by 2031, 
200 banks and insurance companies, 100 hospitals. So all these establishments require a lot of cooling energy. Um, and they presently have been using a lot of um, conventional uh, cooling energy, which can uh, potentially be replaced by uh, alternate solutions like district cooling systems. Similarly, the Rajpur city is the 22nd fastest growing city globally. Uh, population uh, projections say that the population is, will be doubled by 2031. There are uh, foundries and, and uh, which, which have been basically produce a lot of waste heat which can potentially be used in uh, district cooling systems. Uh, Thane again uh, is a fast growing and a mix of uh, IT and retail sector. The hottest climate of the five cities as you may have seen in the graph which represent uh, cooling degree days. Uh, there are uh, large townships and IT parks plant. Uh, Coimbatore city which is in the south of India is again an um, uh, institutional hub. There are uh, so many educational institutes as well as uh, hospitals, IT parks, and then there are uh, special economic zones which are proposed for Coimbatore city. And uh, the last city which is Pune uh, is uh, a big IT hub, uh, top, top six cities uh, for retail estate market. There are 16 special economic zones, several ships, and then uh, you can say of uh, retail space office space as well. So uh, so we just want to uh, say this point that uh, there is already a lot of potential um, in Indian market and um, we believe that uh, cities can create the right conditions to kickstart the DC development, uh, district cooling development in investment in city. We already had a lot of discussions uh, with the local governments, uh, including Rajkot Municipal Corporation, Thane Municipal Corporation, Gopal Municipal Corporation. And uh, from our experience, uh, we uh, came uh, to this conclusion that uh, cities can leverage uh, uh, the authority um, which they have on local planning, building, giving building approvals, and other policy level decisions. Um, promote the use of district cooling in Indian market and uh, so far the discussions have been very very good uh, uh, we have a lot of political support from all these uh, cities the mayors uh, as well as uh, ministers in few cases have uh, shown a lot of interest in these kind of systems and um, as we have we have seen um, uh, these local governments um, themselves has have a lot of uh, uh, build public buildings which uh, which can act as anchor loads if, if they want to uh, if uh, if any of these cities uh, is uh, finalized uh, to implement a pilot project and uh, of course uh, they have the authority to encourage connections to DC network uh, to district cooling network to ensure load diversity. They are always uh, came up with uh, incentives like um, uh, like bonus floor area ratio, additional floor area ratio, or floor space index. They can also uh, you know come up with local regulations, change in the building bylaws or development control regulations to promote the uh, use of district cooling. Uh, so these are uh, some of these uh, some of the ideas uh, which have been shared with the local governments here in in India. And uh, of course, uh, since uh, local governments in the India are the are the focal point for uh, for for the whole community, they can act as the uh, uh, as the coordinator for facilitating all these stakeholder discussions between different entities. Uh, and then, of course, uh, they can uh, they can offer to partly finance uh, some of those um, 
DC project development in cities. They can offer uh, in-kind concessions also in the form of uh, tax incentives, lands, and other kind of uh, uh, concessions that that they may utilize. So uh, this is again, uh, uh, I mean, uh, in nutshell, uh, I would uh, want to brief uh, that. Uh, yeah, Indian cities uh, are, as part of their smart city plan, they are, they are supposed to promote and deploy smart uh, solutions and um, the, the cities are sensitized and are willing to develop policies and incentive mechanisms to promote DES. And uh, we see a lot of potential, as I have mentioned in my previous slides also, there is still a very low level of penetration of air conditioners in Indian uh, market and uh, and then of course uh, we are seeing a very high rate of uh, deployment of conventional air conditioners uh, which uh, presents a very good case for uh, uh, for district cooling systems in India um, and uh, yeah of course uh, the peak load demand is increasing day by day and then it's mostly being comprised of cooling load in urban areas. City government uh, has has the leverage, uh, you know, to catalyze uh, the DC network in cities in India. There is a lot of uh, need for awareness because uh, when it comes to uh, new technologies like district cooling, there is always apprehension in the minds of the end user whether the system will work not work so uh, to overcome these kind of challenges uh, we need to uh, demonstrate projects here in indian market in in cities so hopefully uh, with the with the selection of the cities for deep dive assessment and the finalization of the uh, of the site uh, uh, of uh, the the pilot implementation we should be able to demonstrate uh, one or two pilot projects in cities in India. So uh, this was uh, from my side. Um, I'm happy to take any questions if you have. Thank you very much, Ashish. Um, so the the call is out for everyone in the call. If you if you want to ask questions, please take advantage of this opportunity. Uh, indeed, Ashish mentioned a lot of the instruments, the policy instruments that local governments can use, policy instruments and others. Uh, in the next webinar session, we will indeed go more in depth into some of these instruments that can be used. And uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, in December uh, we will have solutions going online that will also go uh, into depth in some of these um, uh, instruments that can be used. So uh, with this, uh, thank you very much Ashish for your intervention as well. I see we are a little bit tight on time, so without further ado, I would like to invite uh, um, uh, Patrick to uh, share with us a little bit of the very good work that Gothenburg Energy has been doing. Get Gothenburg, which has a long, long experience in history with district energy. So, uh, Patrick, uh, Gothenburg yeah, Energy. Ah, oh, very good. <laughs> Over to you. Yeah, Thank I, can, you. I can talk. I can talk fast, uh, so we can wrap <laughs> up a little bit there. Yeah. Uh, Gotham Energy. Uh, it's a long history uh, of district heating. Uh, just give you a short uh, history lesson or uh, what we've done so far. Uh, just to to uh, show you, this is how uh, substations look in Gothenburg. Uh, you can see we have two exchange here, one for the hot water and one for the heat. There is no no storage for hot water anywhere, so keep that in mind. Uh, this is how it looked in the 60s, and uh, the, we started in really the 50s with the district heating, and in the 70s and 80s there was an oil crisis, and our government uh, 
also keep in mind the government of Gothenburg, the city of Gothenburg owns Gothenburg Energy. So together they make a plan. So because we, we can't do this with oil. Uh, it was a couple of islands and there was oil burners everywhere. And they started to rebuild the district heating network. And as you can see uh, right now, we have uh, connected a lot. We are uh, quite a big network right now. And here is some figures on the network we have. As you can see, we are 1,400 kilo kilometer long. So it's 80,000 cubic meter waters circulated in this network. And, and uh, one thing is, uh, we have a lot of leaks in, in the <laughs> system, uh, of course. So we change the water one time every year. Uh, but uh, instead of digging up the streets, uh, which is cost more, uh, we choose this so far. But we need to change that one. We have around 20,000 substations connected. It's about 96% of Gothenburg's building connected to the district heating network. This is how it's look. Uh, we have a lot of different type of energy sources. We, we use waste energy as long as it's possible. And you can see we have also connected the, the neighbors. Uh, there's com community called Mundal in the south, and it's a little bit community in the north called Kungel. We are connected to these communities because we can change, we can buy from each other. And in the high peak loads, we can use this connection uh, if there are going to be trouble for us, if maybe some of the uh, big um, plants are going down or something wrong is happening. So this is how it looks today. We are using uh, wood chips and natural gas and everything we need uh, to run this system. And for our help uh, to plan, there is we have this economic control room because we need to know what to start. And you can see, I, this is in Swedish there, so I, I'm going to translate it for you. Uh, Anna asked me, it, but I, I couldn't manage. I didn't know what to do. So if you look into the, the blue one in the bottom, that's waste. That's garbage waste. We, we have a big plant that burns garbage. Uh, so that's around, uh, together with two refineries uh, outside Gothenburg, that uh, are about 40, 45% of the total distributing of district heating. So that's a huge uh, for our uh, district heating. And we use uh, is a, the, the little brown, not brown, light brown, that's a wood chips burner. And the brown one, it's, is, uh, the, they, there is uh, transporting, it's, it's a HCP plants, it's power plants. Uh, we can use that when the electricity are cheap and to run with them instead. And in the top we have gas boilers uh, and those peaks are really expensive for us. So we're working to get them down uh, together with the customer of Gothenburg because it's it's cost us a lot to start up these gas boilers and in 2011 we have to start up a oil burner also because we have this high high score cold weather here in Gothenburg at that time here's a little bit of history uh, what we use uh, I don't know if this one is in the way I can move it a little bit I don't know if it's in the way I put it down here so so now we're using waste incineration. Uh, the refineries, uh, you can see, it's on the top. And we have biofuel, CHP plants, heat pumps. And on the top, there is coal and oil. As you can see, we don't use that so long. It was in 2011. We have a little bit of a problem. We need to use the oil burner. Oh, now I can't change pictures. Just a second. No, it's locked somewhere. Can, is there someone? This the picture has locked. I can't move um, it. 
have you pressed pause? Uh, oh. Have you? Pause. Uh, where is that button? Uh, it should be the blue button or gray. Oh, uh, maybe. Button. Let's see. Uh, also, Patrick, don't worry about uh, that display over your slide because we cannot oh. see. We, we cannot, cannot see, see that. that. No, no. Oh. We only see your slide. <laughs> Good. <laughs> but, but there is some problem. We, uh... Louisa, could you please help? I think maybe uh, she will be uh, more agile. <laughs> my face. Um, yeah. It's I locked. Can also, I can also I'll take change. over the presentation if you'd like. Yeah, please, please do. <laughs> I, I believe there's only locked. one. Do you have it, Anna? Yes, I have it, but I believe there's only one slide missing. Is that correct, uh, Patrick? No, it's, <laughs> no, no, it's not. It's, it's a couple of slides left. Ah, okay. Uh, oh. Should, I open it? Should I put it up again, maybe? Now it's working. Okay. Now it's working so please again. continue. <laughs> yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, this is... Uh, Let's see here. I'm gonna. Sh so, uh, do you see the screen now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. This is how it looked like in 1985. Uh, we had pollutions in the air. It was terrible. Uh, as I said before, the government of Gothenburg and Gothenburg Energy together uh, have made. They have. To, we have to do something because this is this is what ter it was terrible. And today, we have a different kind of air in Gothenburg. Uh, it's a lot of work to be done, so this is how it looks today, hopefully uh, every day. And just a little bit teaser, if you don't know what to do with district heating, just connect the ferry. Uh, mm -hmm. This one is leaving to Denmark, so we use the, the district heating to heat up ventilation system and both of the engine. So when the boat is connecting to the dock, they can shut off the engine and just run on district heating. And, of course, we have district cooling also, just two slides of district cooling. This is, uh, we use the seawater because we are a town just close to the sea, and we use the waste heat in the summer to make district cooling. Uh, the, this is not a big system, it's around 100 kilometers right now, but we're working on it. As you can see here, we have, uh, we're going to do a lot of investment and uh, in a couple of years. So this is what we need to do because the demand of cooling increase. And of course district heating is the future. Don't you agree? Thank you so much. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you very much Patrick and uh, sorry that we are a little bit short on time but uh, ah, I, would definitely, I would definitely like to invite you to another session so that you can present even in more detail what you are doing, the very good work you are doing there in Gothenburg and thank you also for sharing on some of the challenges that you are facing. I took note of everything that you said and uh, we'll try to reconnect again on, the, on the aspects you raised. Thank you very much Patrick. Thank you Anna. Uh, so, so far we've had uh, um, uh, thank you to all the presenters uh, from Lili presenting the global initiative and what is going on at the international level. Uh, I presented a little bit on the process guidance we are compiling, but there is a lot more to talk about regarding further policy guidance and additional details. Uh, our colleague from South uh, Ikle, South Asia presented on the potential for district cooling on some Indian cities, reporting on the work that has been done together with UNEP and a few other partners in the initiative. And we've heard also from the city of Gothenburg, Gothenburg Energy uh, in particular, uh, regarding also the work that is being done the, regarding some of the key drivers that have been pushing the city to move forward and the, how this system has evolved uh, to, to the rich mix uh, of energy sources that it has today and combining district heating in articulation with district cooling. These are some very good examples. A lot more is of course uh, of interest and to be shared still on these topics. I. Um, 
I have a few more slides that I would like to share, but before doing so, I would still like to invite um, a couple of participants uh, to share with us uh, on their uh, on their uh, progress regarding district energy on and also uh, on how uh, we could engage and cooperate. So, for example, uh, we have Eduardo from the, the municipality of Temuco, uh, from Chile. Eduardo, would you like to share with us for a little while, and I will unmute you now, would you like to share with us uh, regarding your interest for this particular session and uh, how perhaps the, the initiative could support your local efforts regarding district energy? Hi, everyone. Uh it's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to share with all of you and be part of this session. Um, well, as I said in the pool, in one of the last pool, I, th I think, uh, uh, district heating, is, uh, particularly, um, is part of the work plan for the municipality for the next four years. Uh, could be a project from coming from the uh, main municipality or uh, uh, supporting uh, a, develop, a project developed by uh, the private sector is, is, uh, for the uh, wastewater uh, treatment company in, in our city that is actually uh, evaluating and doing the assessment for a uh, uh, residential project of 20 124 uh, houses in some area in the west area of the of the town. Uh, so the, when we receive the information about this uh, coming from Celia Martinez, we were we were really excited and enthusiastic to to get involved because we think that we were uh, we have all the requirements that uh, we, uh, you need to to run a project like this. Uh, we have a, a plan coming from the Environment Ministry to, to control the air pollution, like Patrick uh, slide in 1985 in, in Gothenburg. <laughs> we, we are, we are going through all that, that, that uh, scenery that pictured every single winner <laughs> since the last 10 years or, or 15 years so we are expecting to 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 fight this situation through through district heating also through improving the isolation of houses also improving the technology for individual heating systems because it's the main heating system in the town using wood fire sticks and and all stoves or heaters but now we are conscious that uh, we can improve that and change that and do it some switching to uh, uh, a massive uh, system like a district heating. Uh, on 2009, uh, with the actual major of the city, uh, which is the major for the next four years, uh, uh, we visit France, for example, Paris, and, and also the French government. County region and, and, and the city in, in that region uh, and, and visit uh, the experience of France in, in district heating and using the biomass, the wood chips in, 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 as a fuel, uh, as a, a natural resource and resource in, in a renewable energy to run a, 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 a a power plan, a district heating plant in, in, in the capital of the region of French Comte. I can't remember the name of the name right now, but uh, uh, we had that experience and we, since that time, we are running, we are uh, getting involved and receiving information and, and working as a, as a city uh, in, in try to to get all figured out and and, and 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 obtain the results because you you have to coordinate the private sector and also the 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 lo local authorities the government 
the financial, the resources, the budget, uh, all the pieces of the puzzle. But now we're we're feeling that we're very close. We're closer than from the beginning. Okay, very good. Thank you very much, uh, Eduardo. Uh, thank you for sharing. I would also like to invite uh, uh, one of the colleagues from the city of Bogota, um, perhaps uh, Gina Paola. Uh, would you like to share with us briefly as well? Uh, and I've now unmuted you. Uh, you should be able to speak. Okay, I think we can hear now. Not yet. It seems that uh, there is a sound problem. Uh, perhaps uh, if another colleague could intervene. Uh, for example, Santiago Daza, I'm going to unmute you. Santiago, would you like to say a few words regarding Bogota's interest on district energy? Um, I, it seems it's not working. Um, I would like to encourage the colleagues from Bogota to type either in the questions panel or in the chat panel uh, because we would of course like to hear from you as well. In the meantime and hoping uh, it is still possible to, um, to hear from you uh, from any of the Bogota colleagues during this session, I would like to share with you a few final slides. Um, so, if you give me just a few moments, and I hope you can now see my slides, just to share with you briefly um, on, for example, how cities interested in the initiative can join. And joining is done at no cost. The process to join is very simple. Uh, all is needed, all that is needed is a letter of interest. We actually have a template available with text that you can use. Uh, of course, this would have to be put into the letterhead of your organization. Uh, and preferably should be signed by the mayor, but that's uh, not a requirement. Uh, someone else, a uh, delegated person, could sign it as well. And this letter should then be addressed to UNEP uh, and ECLAY. Uh, so, the, as you see, it's a very simple process. Of course, then we would, uh, we would follow up uh, with the proposed meeting for scoping of joint activities, and this could be done, for example, through phone call if a physical meeting is not possible. So, uh, we, we invite you to consider joining the initiative because indeed it brings uh, opportunities for sharing, for exchanging with other cities and peer learning, but also to give visibility to the good work, to your experiences uh, and your expertise, even your technical solutions, uh, and disseminate them and replicate them to other cities as well. Some, these are some of the opportunities for engaging uh, in the near future as well. In addition to the webinar series, as mentioned, uh, there are materials that, guidance materials that are being developed and your inputs and review are very welcome. Of course, individual ex esper experts and organizations are recognized and of course we also encourage you to share any existing case studies or other resources that you may have and which you want to make visible and want to, to disseminate. 
Um, in addition, we would like to encourage the cities to report their actions, their district energy actions, their cogeneration and tree generation actions and targets in the Carbon Climate Registry. This is a global platform for local climate and energy data, uh, which is available for free to all local and subnational governments uh, and cities such as Gothenburg, such as, for example, Vancouver, Paris. These are already reporting their district energy actions in this platform and uh, we encourage you, encourage other cities to do so because this helps us in uh, the advocacy work in helping to raise uh, advantage um, in helping to raise awareness and to secure resources for this type of work. Finally, uh, I would like to invite you to the upcoming webinars. So very soon, already in December 13th, we are going to have a follow-up webinar with several speakers uh, from the public and private sector and we'll be looking into the energy massive master planning process and possible tools to use, but we'll also look into policy and regulatory instruments to promote high load density and load certainty uh, in favor of the implementation and expansion of district energy. So we hope these will be of interest to you. As the webinar series goes on, we will further look into the business case and business model. So we'll then move to concrete projects and making concrete uh, district energy projects viable uh, and with a sound uh, business model. So we look forward uh, and hope you'll be able to join us uh, in future sessions. Uh, if you are interested in speaking at any of these sessions, also please let us know. I thank you very much for your time and attention. Uh, on behalf of UNEP and ECLE as well, uh, I would uh, still like to take one last look to the questions and uh, comments uh, just to see if there are any other uh, oh yes, I see actually there is one comment from a colleague, I don't know if this is still relevant or not. Nikhil, I've unmuted you, I apologize, I hadn't seen uh, your, uh, your comment earlier. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, can you hear me Anna? Yes, I can hear you, go ahead please. Yeah, I would just like to quickly add from the experience in Indian cities also from uh, you know, associating with this initiative because uh, uh, it's important uh, in terms of the technical capacity that uh, exists with the partners and also that they have experience in the process. So that is important uh, because that has helped uh, getting, uh, making the mayors and uh, say the administrative heads aware of the technology, getting their buy-in and uh, we see a lot of willingness from them. They are really happy to implement it and support in any way, like be it uh, make, uh, changing their regulation, building regulation, building bylaws, uh, giving incentives, or say uh, giving in-kind concessions. So, and also uh, with the UNEP team, uh, we have been uh, really successful in. Uh, reaching out to the building developers, the property developers who are also a, a good target group because uh, ultimately uh, it's going to be implemented in their premises and it also helps in collecting data which is really important because in most of the in the polls it, uh, I saw that uh, many of the cities or the audience uh, they don't have DES in place so getting that baseline data is also important and that uh, this process has also helped us connect with the people or the data owners and uh, going forward collecting data and then uh, you know going towards moving towards implementation yeah so that's all that's a quick comment that i just wanted to add Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that, Nikhil. I'm sorry I missed the, your request to speak earlier on and indeed mm -hmm. uh, raising, uh, they, raising very good points which are relevant everywhere, not, uh, not just uh, in India but uh, 
but everywhere regarding the importance of gathering data, the importance of uh, raising awareness in the local politicians and the value that the partners in the initiative, including from the partners, the private sector, bring uh, in with the practical experience that they have from multiple, from the implementation of multiple projects and so on. So I think uh, I thank you for that. It's uh, it really helps to highlight some of the benefits of participating in the initiative and. Um, Nikhil, let's continue to exchange via email also in the preparation of the upcoming sessions because uh, I definitely would like to, to use these sessions as well to move forward and take advantage of the work that is being done in India, of course. So with this, I thank you all, thank you all the speakers, uh, thank you all the participants as well and to all the colleagues that shared with us. Uh, thank you so much, Patrick, as well. Uh, for having shared uh, from your case and uh, I hope we will see all each other again in, uh, in uh, uh, an upcoming webinar soon. So, if you, thank you very much Patrick. With the last slide I would like to leave you with the contacts uh, for everyone. Uh, if you'd like to reach me this is my email address and the marks here at the Clay World Secretariat. You can also see here Lily's email address for the United Nations Environment uh, and we can, uh, either of us, we can both provide uh, the support uh, you may need regarding joining the initiative. So thank you all once again. Wishing you a nice evening or a nice day. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye.